of them fall. And that started in Libya. And it's amazing because Libya and Syria are two of the, of the most brutal regimes in, the, in, the, in North Africa and the Middle East in terms of the means they have, the methods they use. And yet with great courage, the youth came out onto the streets. In Libya, at the beginning, it looked like the, it was going to spread across Libya just like in Egypt and Tunisia. Then Ghazi, and then all is, is swept from the east towards the west, Nizrata, and, and other towns. <coughs> But then um, we see a change taking place within Libya um, where the revolution stalls and it's changed into something else. From a genuine revolution, a movement of the masses, because what happened in, in Benghazi and the cities was the state there also collapsed. Gaddafi's state in these areas collapsed. They lost control of the whole, of, of whole cities with the masses moving. But then you have also the question of the leadership in, 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 in Libya. This interim council then, then became called the interim government um, came, uh, came to the fore. And initially, if you remember, the youth in particular, the revolutionary youth, were saying no to outside help. They even had a big banner saying no, we can do the job ourselves. That layer, that, that youth was sidelined. And then they started calling for um, NATO intervention. Uh, the Arab League voted the resolution that gave you, you, the UN the, the go-ahead to um, uh, approve a no-fly zone. The French being the first um, and the most enthusiastic in this. Again, there you have to look at certain problems the French have got. First of all, they were very embarrassed over Tunisia. But over Libya, they can partly make up for it by saying it's a humanitarian mission, humanitarian bombing. We've seen that now. They've even killed uh, the forces of the, of the rebel, rebels uh, a few times, bombing their own people, as we always see in such cases. Um, but Sarkozy has good reason to be so bombastic. Um, his popularity ratings are the lowest ever. I think the latest show is around 20%. It means he's facing defeat at the next elections. And he wants to uh, strut around on the world stage and do a kind of Thatcher with the Falklands or Bosch with Iraq and uh, try and gain from this. And so the French were the most gung-ho. The British, where Cameron was facing a similar situation back then, um, attacking the British workers, also needed some kind of diversion. And the Americans, you know, they, they've admitted it, they couldn't be outmaneuvered by the French. Um, they didn't want to go into Libya because they think, well, we've got enough on our hands with Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. This is not another Muslim country that we get bogged down in and can't get out. As I say, it's easy to go in, it's very difficult to get out. But in the end, they were, they were, they were sucked into this. Now, what's happening in Libya today? And what should the position of socialists be? Go back to Egypt and Tunisia. Had the workers actually taken power in Tunisia and Egypt, the revolution would have had very strong allies in Tunisia and Egypt. But the revolution has only, only begun <coughs> in Tunisia and Egypt. And in Libya, it's been cut across and changed into something else. It's become a military conflict between two forces. One of them, the interim um, government, which has the backing of imperialism. And if we look at the uh, composition of this government, it's, uh, it, it tells you quite a lot uh, about what kind of government it is and what it represents. Um, the president of the interim council is Gaddafi's ex-minister of justice. Then we have the ex-minister of the interior, who's gone over, who went over to the rebels in February. We see this phenomenon in all revolutions. Elements of the old regime, when they see the regime about to collapse, jump ship with the, with the idea of enhancing their authority for having broken with the previous regime and to play a role in the new regime, but basically defending the same class interests as they did before. And we saw these people in Libya doing this. We had, the, without, we had this phenomenon also in, in, in Tunisia and Egypt. Um, they clearly thought the sweep of the revolution is now going to overthrow Gaddafi, we jump ship, and we become the de facto new government. The French clearly thought they were going to, the regime was, was going to go quickly. They, they were the first to recognize the new government, um, the, the new government, the, the interim government. 
Um, we look at other people. Uh, there's a certain Khalifa Hifter. He arrived, arrived in Benghazi on March the 14th, therefore played no role in the actual uh, revolution. He came directly from exile here in the United States. This was a reactionary individual who uh, had been backed, trained, and funded by the CIA in the past. And he's catapulted into this um, government. We have other individuals. Uh, Ali Tarhouni. He arrived at the end of February. He was appointed finance minister on the 23rd, 23rd of March. He fled Libya back in 1973. Now, if we go back a little bit into the history of Libya, the coup of 1969 brought to power a regime under Gaddafi, which was an anti-communist regime. You read the you read the statements they made at the time. Uh, one of their one of their documents said that communism was the most dangerous thing on, on the planet, etc. The crisis in the mid 70s, the famous 1974 recession, pushed Gaddafi to reach a conclusion that the local capitalists, the merchant capitalists, the small capitalists in Libya, couldn't develop the economy, and he proceeded to nationalize key sectors of the economy. He ended up leaning on the, on the Soviet Union. As a result, a section of his regime, military officers who had helped him come to power in 69, moved against him. They were trying to defend. Um, the local capitalist class in, in Libya. And they, there were some several attempted coups. Gaddafi defeated them, and, and several of them went into exile. These people are now back in Libya. Um, yeah. Um, and, and there's other figures like this, um, like uh, El Hariri, minister, he's been made the military, military affairs minister. He was also involved in the coup, but also tried to move against Gaddafi. If we look at the nature of this um, uh, this government, the so-called government in the East, it's it's being moulded and shaped according to the interests of imperialism, and it pushes the interests of imperialism. If you look at their program and the the, the, the personalities on the government, these are all people. Some, one guy actually was involved in training in the managerial skills, uh, capitalist uh, methods of running industry, um, pushing privatization in Libya under Gaddafi. Now here we have an element which shows it. The left, I think, some on the left have been a little, somewhat confused by the situation. Uh, who do you support in Libya, for example, if you're a socialist? We would argue you don't support either side. Um, we support the Lib Libyan revolution and we supported the masses that rose up. Unfortunately, They've been politically expropriated by this government, which is made up of a lot of ex gaddafi people. I can imagine this government is appealing to the people of Tripoli. The people of Tripoli can choose between a government which is made up of ex gaddafi ministers or Gaddafi. <laughs> um, not much of a choice. But if we go a bit further back, and the question is, was Gaddafi's regime a progressive regime? And this is another question we have to ask ourselves. There was a period in which Gaddafi was genuinely in conflict with imperialism. He'd taken over significant sections of the economy and was in conflict. But the fact is that since at least 2003, but if we go, we go back to the early 90s, um, and this is similar, I, don't, I can't explain Syria, but the same kind of thing has been happening. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in both these countries, laws began to be introduced for the letting foreign banks gradually gradually allowing more and more capitalist development. And in 2003, Gaddafi clearly decided that rather than end up with Saddam Hussein, made it better to cut a deal. And you had um, Condoleezza Rice visiting Gaddafi, Tony Blair visiting Gaddafi, um, Ferris Horn, very good friend of Gaddafi. The fact that Gaddafi actually owns a significant share of the Fiat company and has provided big investments there. Um, and if you look at a leaked cable from the US Embassy in Tripoli as recently as August 2009, it describes, it says, Libya has acted as a critical ally in US counterterrorism efforts and is considered one of our primary partners in combating the flow of foreign fighters. And other quotes could be found of a, of a similar nature. Um, laws were passed allowing privatization Several companies were privatized. Saif, Gaddafi's uh, son, was known as a liberal in the sense that he was for privatization and he was pushing this agenda. Therefore, for, if you look at the economic program of the interim government in the East, 
and Saif and Gaddafi regime in Tripoli, there is no fundamental difference. And Marxists always look at that aspect above anything else in deciding uh, whether a regime is progressive or whatever. Um, there is, there is, the one difference I would I, I outline, and this is the case of Libya and Syria, because also in Syria we had privatizations. The richest man in Syria is a cousin <coughs> of Assad. He's the owner of Sirta, which owns the majority of the um, cell phone market in Syria. And he's a private capitalist, but he's a cousin of Assad. And several of these figures have appeared. In Syria and Libya, what we had was the regime adopting the Chinese model. They even used the same terminology. Um, Assad, uh, the, the, the regime in Syria a few years ago, declared themselves a social market economy. Exactly the same terminology as in China. And what, it, what is the Chinese model? The state holds on to a section of the economy, privatizes another section, trying to develop Chinese capitalism, and trying to keep power within the same elite which previously was a bureaucracy of a, of a, of a publicly owned economy, transforming them into capitalists. In Libya, what Saif meant by privatization was members of the family and the clique around them becoming the owners of the means of production. The same in Syria. You could argue that the government in um, the East, if it comes to power, would also privatize, but probably being weaker would end up being uh, uh, more open to imperialist uh, grabbing of, of the resources. But for the masses, it makes no fundamental difference whether an economy is privatized to a Libyan capitalist, or to an American, or to a French, or whatever. The oil, they've already given nice contracts to the French companies, the Italians, the Americans, etc. Libya has introduced confusion into the Arab Revolution, and that is the role the imperialists wanted. They wanted to send a message, which because they saw a very dangerous situation, Tunisia, Egypt, next it could be Yemen, Jordan, uh, and all the other regimes, and the whole of the Middle East could have had a revolutionary uprising. Libya has introduced the idea that it's not so simple, and if you go down that road, you're going to have civil war. That's what Assad has been using in Syria to confuse uh, the masses. And it, it, it's, uh, this is the role that it's playing for the imperialists. Um, so we have to be clear. As Marxists, we support the revolutions that have erupted in one country after another. Uh, we supported the Libyan revolution. So that, you know, this, this marvelous movement of the youth, revolution, revolutionary youth in Libya. But we also have to look at how things have developed. And the imperialists are not sitting by and just let it, letting it happen. They have big interests. Saudi Arabia is too important. And Bahrain but has the American Fifth Fleet. And I explain why there's no, there's no UN resolution condemning Saudi Arabia what it's doing in Bahrain. Whereas in Libya, they have a resolution. Um, they use different measures, different weights and different measures, because they have different interests in the different, even in the different uh, countries. But um, although this is this is the case, um, and this this confusion and this stalling of the revolution has taken place, it's not going to stop. We're going to have setbacks, but all revolutions throughout history, we've seen setbacks. The Russian Revolution started in February. It ended in October. It, it took. It was only a short period between let's say, the beginning of what looked like a democratic revolution to its completion as a socialist revolution in October because there was one fundamental difference, there was the Bolshevik party. But at the beginning of the Russian Revolution in February, the Bolsheviks were not the majority. You had a lot of illusions that uh, democracy and uh, the, you know, the masses can achieve um, anything. They learned through bitter lessons that it wasn't so simple. And even in the middle of uh, um, 1917, you had reactionary moments when the Bolsheviks had to go into hiding, Lenin had to go into exile, they could have been executed, some of the Trotsky and others were in prison. But it was the experience that led the masses in Russia to understand that they had to go further. And that's why the Bolsheviks began to grow as a, as a big force. In, a, in the Arab world, that is, what, that is the essential element that's missing in the equation. And that explains the confusion in Libya, the, the difficulties in Syria, um, and it's going it's to be a longer process because there isn't that leadership. But the masses in the Arab world are not going to go back to accepting a dictatorial, despotic regime in a country like Egypt or Tunisia. They're going to have to give some kind of democratic concession. But as we see, <coughs> the masses keep saying they keep moving forward in countries like Tunisia and Egypt. 
They achieve one thing, then they say, right, now you've all got to go.